Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. My name is Brad Cartwright, and I just wanted to take a second to let you know about bradcartwright.com, which is a website designed for IB economic students and teachers to help you fill the gap between what the IB expects you to do as a teacher or student, and then how to actually do it in the classroom. So don't forget to check out the description box below at all of the different options that are available to you as an IB economic student or teacher. Beyond that, enjoy this video. All right, now let's take a look at another concept in behavioral economics called choice architecture. This is really interesting because there actually are these creatures out there called choice architects. <laughs> and they're people, what's an architect do, right? They design a structure upon which people make choices. And choice architecture is really interesting and it really influences a lot of the ways in which we make our economic decisions, okay? So first of all, let's take a look at what it is, okay? Choice architecture is the theory that the decisions that we make are heavily influenced by the way someone, referred to as a choice architect, presents the choices to us, okay? An example is like in the supermarket checkout line, which is an example that I've talked about before. It's like, you know, our choices are made based on available, the things that we see, right? We're human beings. We, the more we see something, advertising is an entirely huge construct of choice architecture. They create these ideas in our heads that we will be cooler if we have certain products, right? Um, Apple computers or Apple iPhones, iPads, there's an iPad, I, you know, uh, MacBooks, like they're all designed around this idea of being cool. Um, and that's a, that's a form of choice architecture. What we're talking about here is when you're in the checkout line, and again, you see something like, you know, some candy or something that you wouldn't normally buy, but you buy it anyway. Somebody decided to set up a structure. They were an architect of a structure that affected the choices that you made. Now, if they made all, if they put all healthy stuff there, you might've made a healthy choice, right? But they didn't. Right? Or if, they, if they, they didn't put really expensive stuff there either, because if they put really expensive stuff there, then you might not buy it. But if it's, if, it's, if it's relatively cheap and something that you would just buy on impulse, well then somebody, a choice architect, has made a decision that has created a structure, they're an architect of the structure, that made you make that particular choice. It's super, really, super fascinating. Well, psychology is really fascinating and human beings are fascinating, so that's why economics is fascinating as well. Okay. So oh, another, like a way of breaking that down is choice architects create this default choice. And an example is when um, choice architecture can be observed. So like Google searches, like, you know, you get something and you just default to Google. Many young people don't realize that Google was like one of the last search engines to get into the game. There was Yahoo, there was Excite, Netscape had its own thing, um, Microsoft had its own thing. But Google's taken over as like the verb to, means to search on the internet. Oh, Google that. Um, and the reason for that is it just becomes the default thing. And when it's the default thing, you're making a choice, but you didn't even really mean it. Um, like when something comes in and it's the default browser on your computer, like Safari on Microsoft or on Apple products is the default browser. And all of a sudden you're just like using uh, uh, Safari, even though you didn't really make the choice. By default, you made the choice because somebody created the structure or the architecture for you to make that decision. Okay. Another example is like Starbucks, you know especially people living outside the United States who are from the United States, they love to go to Starbucks, not because the coffee is exceptionally good, and it's also actually exceptionally expensive. They go there because that's just the place that they wanna to go to have an experience. By default, if they're looking for coffee, then they go to a place that they're gonna be able to anticipate certain kinds of products, and that is Starbucks, and maybe they go in there and without even thinking, they just get the same thing every single time, like, I do. <laughs> Every time I go in Starbucks, which is not very much now, but a few years ago, I used to go to Starbucks all of the time. And what would I get? I would get a mochaccino, period, grande. Why? I don't know, because I liked it, right? I didn't go in there and make a bunch of choice. I was just by default, that was the thing that I was most comfortable doing, which gets, gets to that like status quo inertia decision, um, you know, cognitive bias that I might have. 
But Starbucks could run whatever sales they want, but just because that's what I like and that's what I liked before, I just stay with it and buy it and feel happy, right? So Starbucks is so good worldwide because a lot of people associate that with something that they know and they just stay with what they know and therefore Starbucks can charge higher prices and, and people go there anyway, okay? So what are the key things about default, default options that choice architects would look at? Okay, well, the key points are though, <clears throat> this does not always bring the best outcomes, default options are very popular. Right? And this is where the status quo bias is alive. I just talked about this a little bit. Consumers may not have the time or interest or cognitive skills to understand all of the alternatives, and they may just lack the courage to change and are comfortable with what they already know. There's an example of, of um, you know, like the default options. I kind of like did it out of order, but whatever, you get it. Like Starbucks and then default options, these key points, you, it makes sense. Okay, so default options are also at play in certain sorts of case studies. And in a lot of states in the United States, when you go and get your driver's license, in the United States, you get a driver's license based on the state that you live on, in, and you have, can decide whether or not you are um, an organ donor or not. Some states allow you to opt in to the program, which means if you get in a car accident and you're dead, then you... The, the, the choice here is like, are you going to donate your organs or not? What is the default choice? I grew up in Ohio. When it happened in Ohio, you had to opt in to the program. So by default, you didn't donate your organs. But, so, so if you decide to do nothing, then your organs were not donated. But if, um, now I have a, a, a driver's license in the United States in New Hampshire, and the default option is that I am an organ donor. So guess what happens to the number of organ donors in a place where you have to opt out of it? Well, obviously, if you don't opt out by default, you are donating your organs, right? And you can see there can be some politics in this because is the government deciding that I'm just in, innately an organ donor by very much being alive and having a driver's license? Or do I actually get to have a choice? But choice architects are in like they do play into this whole thing of what are the options and what is the bit, what is the default option? By default option, are you an organ donor? Or by default option, are you not an organ donor? If your society wants organ donors, then make people opt out. If you believe that everybody has the right to do what they want with their own organs, even by, by or they must actually have to make the decision, then have people have to opt in, okay? So very important topic there, default options in terms of what actually happens in, in uh, what's the outcome is of a decision based on what the default options are available to person um, that those are created by those people who we call choice architects. <laughs> All right, last topic here, mandated choice. What does this mean? Well, this is another example of choice architects influencing consumers. These are situations where consumers are required by law to make a choice in advance. Organ donation is a good example of this. I just talked about it, right? They must click a box when they get their driver's license, forcing a choice, right? These are both examples of choice architects making decisions for us. That means mandated choice, like you have to choose. It's a required field. You must fill it out, right? So you're mandating a choice to opt in or opt out um, is, like a, is like a step further along in terms of, of choice architecture because at least you're making people have to decide. It's not like just by default that a decision has been made for them, okay? So pretty cool stuff, my friends, right? Choice architecture, it's the ways in which outside influences, outside people influence our decisions and what behavioral economists are saying over and over and over again is that our behavior as consumers is not just based on rational consumer thinking, as the neoclassicists used to say. And again, it's not about being right or wrong. The cool thing about IB economics is you get all the information and then you get to make the argument. And that's where this behavioral economic stuff makes economics so, so cool because it empowers you to decide in your evaluation what you think and then you build an argument around that. All right, my friends, there we have it. Cognitive biases blended into this notion of choice architecture. And we'll see you in the next one.